Everybody is celebrating uh, at the Fed pulled off a miracle. We got rid of inflation and we never even had to hurt the economy. Right? Everything is fine. Right? We, we, we've dodged this bullet. We had the, the most reckless period of monetary policy in U.S. history. We had interest rates at zero for a dozen years. Massive QE. And all it took was a few rate hikes back up to 5%. And that inflation genie is right back in the bottle. And it's never going to show its, its, its face again. And, and this is great. The economists, the Wall Street strategists are completely wrong. They're wrong on the economy. They're wrong on inflation. And that's why all their investment decisions are wrong. A series of positive economic data releases this week combined to suggest that the U.S. economy is performing exceptionally well with stronger than expected growth, low unemployment, rising wages, and falling inflation. Peter Schiff, a prominent investment figure known for warning about looming economic threats, has expressed that economists and Wall Street strategists are fundamentally misguided. According to Schiff, these financial experts need to make more accurate assessments regarding the economy's state and inflation. The Commerce Department reported on Thursday that U.S. gross domestic product a broad measure of economic health grew at an annualized rate of 3.3% in the final quarter of the year, down from 4.9% in the previous quarter, but in line with pre-pandemic growth, and well ahead of the 2% economists had expected. Schiff argues that the government's GDP numbers are misleading due to insufficient adjustments for the actual inflation rate, further distorting the perception of economic health. The U.S. national debt hit a new record of $34.1 trillion in January 2024, according to the latest data from the Treasury Department. This is an increase of $4.3 trillion from January 2020, when the debt was $29.8 trillion. The Federal Reserve has been attempting to cool economic activity to bring down inflation. Since March 2022, the Fed has increased rates to a 22-year high and held them there. Inflation has fallen from a high of 9% in June 2022, to 3.4 percent. In Schiff's view, the current economic growth is deceptive, as it involves covering up a shrinking economy with debt and spending. Let's now delve into the video to explore more. But before we begin, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to stay updated with the latest content. This GDP number doesn't confirm that we have a good economy. All it confirms is that there was more spending in the economy, because that's really what's being measured, government spending, uh, uh, personal spending. Um, and the big factors driving the GDP was the increase in government spending. <laughs> well, where's the government getting this money? It's borrowing it. That's not a recipe for economic growth. That's a recipe for disaster. The national debt, even if you look at the percentage that it's growing, and forgetting about the dollar, dollar amount, but the debt is growing much faster than the economy. So are we getting richer or are we getting poorer? You know, if you're just looking at your assets and not looking at your liabilities, you could think you're really rich. Yes, I grew my assets by $100,000. I'm $100,000 richer. Well, what if your liabilities grew by $200,000? You're $100,000 poorer, right? But if you just focus on one side of the balance sheet and you ignore what's going on on the other side, you can pretend anything. That's what we're doing. We're looking at what did we grow the economy to, but we're not looking at all the money we had to borrow to get that growth. If we had to borrow a dollar to get 10 cents worth of economic growth, was it really worth it? Was it worth going into debt? No. Did we borrow ourselves into riches? No, we didn't. We borrowed ourselves deeper into debt and poverty. Plus also, not only do we have more debt, Right, to show for this small amount of supposed growth. But now we have to service that debt. We have to repay that debt with interest. So that diminishes economic growth in the future when we're burdened by the responsibility to repay and service this debt. So this is not real economic growth. The economy is shrinking. We're covering it up with debt and spending. And we're looking at the result of that, which is this GDP number, and we're pretending everything is great. And again, another reason, too, that the GDP numbers go up is because we don't adjust them enough for the real rate of inflation. The deflator maybe captures half of the inflation, and that overstates economic growth. That's another reason the government likes to underreport inflation, is because every time they underreport inflation, they get a twofer. 
They tell the public that inflation is lower, which is good, but they also get to tell them that economic growth is higher, which is also good, right? So they lie about these numbers. And it's not like they just lie. The, the, the methodology for computing the numbers is a lie. So the numbers are designed not to be accurate. They're designed to understate inflation and overstate growth. And so they, they work the way they were designed uh, to work. Um, we got, you know, the trade deficit again in goods. Again, $88.5 billion uh, deficit. I mean, these are huge numbers. I mean, it was slightly less huge than the uh, $89.3 billion from the prior month. But these are gargantuan trade deficits. We are hemorrhaging red ink on a, a trade level. I mean, if we had a good economy, where is it in the trade numbers? Again, they try to tell us that because our economy is so strong, we run these big deficits. That's like a, a CEO of a company. Yeah, because our company is doing so great, that's why we're losing all this money. I mean, this is a measurement. Strong economies, wealthy economies generate trade surpluses. <laughs> it's the basket case economies that, 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 that can't produce enough to, for their own citizens, and they have to rely on what other countries produce, and they run a deficit, and they go broke. The other potentially damning metric over the short run is the M2 money supply. U.S. M2 money supply is at a current level of $20.87 trillion, up from $20.77 trillion last month and down from $21.36 trillion one year ago. This is a change of 0.47% from the previous month and minus 2.31% from one year ago. Schiff predicted that the money supply would likely reach a new all-time high before the end of the year. On Friday, President Biden hailed fresh government data showing that annual inflation over the second half 2023 fell back to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. Schiff argued that this surge in the money supply is a clear sign of inflation, indicating an expansion of both money and credit. Now, let's shift our focus to a video. We got the M2 money supply earlier this week, and it rose for the month. This is a monthly number that we get. Every month they tell you the, the M2. And it was up a half a percent in, in one month. That's a big increase, almost $100 billion in, in new money added to the, the economy in a month. Now, that's inflation, right? The expansion of the money supply, the expansion of the credit supply. Now, M2 did start contracting from about the middle, I think it was June-ish or so, of 2022. Uh, and for about maybe nine, 10 months, money supply was coming down. Now, compared to how much it went up in the few years prior, you can barely see it on a chart. But yes, it was a slight decline from the peak. So money supply went like this, and then a little teeny bit down, right? Now it's going back up. It's kind of been bumping around, and now it's turned higher. And I think money supply is going to surge before the end of this year. It's going to hit a new all-time high in money supply. So money supply is growing. What does that tell you about inflation? That is inflation. But here's my point now. If the balance sheet is barely less than, you know, $8 trillion, and they're already talking about slowing down the quantitative tightening, now you know this is just a precursor to stopping it completely and going the other way. I mean, I think that's the big pivot that's coming. Not the rate cuts, but the re return to QE. I think we're going to return to QE soon maybe April, May, I mean, before the election. Now, they already talked about that, that term funding bailout program that started last March. The Fed came out this week and they said, you know what, we're going to change it. We're not going to do any more of these bailouts. Uh, we're going to stop the facility going forward for new loans, um, which I think is going to be a problem. I mean, they should do that. But they, they didn't say anything about the loans that were already made and whether or not they're going to be uh, forced to be repaid in March, which is, you know, that was the terms. It was a one-year loan. Everybody's supposed to pay the money back, but of course, nobody has the money to pay it back, so it's not even possible. And all the banks uh, would fail if they were forced to repay the loans. But I also think that now that the Fed is making it clear that banks can't go to the Fed anymore, that's going to create another run on the smaller banks. Because the only reason the smaller banks are surviving is because the Fed is there making these loans. 
And if they don't make these loans anymore, the public could pull out their money because they want to have their money in the too big to fail banks. I mean, if your bank isn't too big to fail, it probably will. So take your money out. And, and so that's another moral hazard that the government creates with its plans is it tilts the playing field even further in favor of the big banks, which get bigger and bigger and bigger, which of course, you know, can't fail because they're systemically important. So it just makes the whole system that much more vulnerable to concentrate more and more deposits in the largest, most insolvent banks. But because they're so large and so insolvent, we can't let them go broke, right? And so it just creates an even bigger problem. And that's what they're, uh, they're, they're doing here uh, with, that, with, that, with that program. But all of this uh, money supply growth, um, this is the big pivot. It's going to be back to quantitative easing, which is going to be done for a multiple of reasons. One is to prop up the banks. Two, to prop up the government, because the government can't afford uh, to pay the interest on the debt. And, and, and so the Fed is, is cognizant of this as much as it denies that that's what's driving policy. That is absolutely what's driving policy. The U.S. economy ended 2023 on a solid note, with GDP rising 3.3% quarter over quarter, smashing expectations for a more moderate gain of 2%. The consumer remained a key factor, underpinning last quarter's strength, with spending accelerating sharply through the holiday shopping season. Inflation continued to drift lower in December. With the 12-month change on core PCE, the Fed's preferred inflation measure slipping below 3%. In light of recent economic data, what are the prevailing views on the potential for inflation in the U.S. over the next few years? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you found this content helpful, give it a thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to stay updated. Thank you for being a part of this journey with us.